and welcome uh, uh, to this online conference. It's great to see so many of you here today. First, uh, I'd like uh, to thank Zach Davison and other people that are with us. Thank you for joining Gashin's event. <laughs> so it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Zach Davison. Zach Davison is an award-winning translator, writer, and scholar of Japanese folklore and ghosts. He graduated at the University of Sheffield in Japanese studies with a master's thesis on Yure. He is the author of his well-known uh, Yure, the Japanese ghost from the uh, Chim Music Press. He contributed articles to Weite's magazine, Metropolis magazine, Kansai Time Out, the Comics Journal, and the comic book we were from uh, Image Comics. As a manga translator, he was nominated for the 2014 Japanese-US Friendship Commission Translation Prize for his translation of the Eisner Award winning of the Eisner Award winning and Harvey nominated Shigeru Mizuki Showa 1926-1939, A History of Japan. Other translation works include uh, Satoshi Kon's works such as The Art of Satoshi Kon for Dark Horse. He was also a researcher and on-screen talent for National Geographic's TV special Japan Lost Souls of Okinawa. His uh, last translation is uh, Tono Monogatari by Music Shigeru that was published for Drone and Quarterly this year. So today, uh, Zach, Davison, uh, Zach Davison's talk today is about yokai. The title of this lecture is A Brief History of Yokai. And I think it will be very, very interesting for our academic community because uh, we haven't any courses about Japanese folklore at the moment. So I think his work will be very, very inspiring for us. Um, if you have uh, any questions or comments, you can write in the chat box uh, also during the conference, or you can turn on your mic and ask uh, your questions directly at uh, the end of the lecture. I would like to inform you that the conference will be audio and video recorded and then published on our YouTube channel, so subscribe. If you don't want your image and voice uh, to appear in recordings, I can only ask you to keep your webcam and microphone turned off. By turning them on, you are giving your consent to use uh, your image uh, and your voice. So, Zach, the floor is yours, and thank you very much. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning for me here in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. Thank you all so much for having me, and I am very excited to be here. So, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I would love it if people would interact with me in the chat, by the way. So I do these Zoom lectures and I think it's fantastic. It's been a wonderful thing to learn to do this, to be able to reach out to people across the world I wouldn't get to meet normally, but I am still sitting here in my room by myself with my dog Mochi and my cat Shere Khan. So it's fantastic to have that interaction in the chat and much appreciated. Today, as said, we're going to talk about a brief history of yokai. So first of all, a little introduction of myself. Once again, my name is Zach Davison. Uh, I do a couple different things. Along with doing these lecture series, I'm a manga translator. I'm the English translator of Mizuki Shigeru's famous folklore comic, Kitaro, uh, Gonagai's Devil Man, and Go Tanabe's At the Mountains of Madness. And I'm also a folklorist who writes my own books. So I've written quite a few different books on Japanese folklore. I did my master's degree in Hiroshima on Yurei, the Japanese ghost, which was my first book. I've also written books on Mon Kaibyo, the supernatural cats of Japan, as well as yokai stories. Anytime I do these kind of lectures, I think it's important to just sort of say right up front that, you know, I am not Japanese um, by birth or raising. I moved to Japan and lived there later on in my life. So these are not my stories. This is not my culture and this is not my history, but it is something that living in Japan, I really fell in love with. And as a translator and folklorist, it's kind of my role to serve as a bridge between these two countries, um, you know, to make available in English language this culture and hopefully to share and spread my love in it. But once again, this is not my culture. and These are not my stories that I am sharing. Also, and this is really key in that one of the things this lecture is going to hope to answer is sort of that question of what is a yokai? Just know that everything I tell you here and everything I show you, it's my interpretation. There is a lot of different answers. What is yokai is almost an unanswerable question. And I 
guarantee you that where you have someone different doing this lecture, they would have a different answer than I do. It's almost part of the fun of yokai research, right? Ever since people started researching yokai scholarly in the Meiji period with Enyo Inye and Kunio Yanagita, they violently disagreed with each other on what a yokai actually is, and that has continued to the present day. So I encourage you to after this lecture to learn more, explore the world of yokai more, and um, learn some of your own conclusions. So that said, let's get this yokai parade started. I'm going to start off by introducing some of Japan's various weird and wonderful yokai. The first one is the one that almost everyone knows. This is a kappa. A kappa is a, literally translates as water child, and it's this sort of, um, imp or demon of the river that lives inside the rivers of Japan and it has a little bowl of water on its head that it needs to keep water in to survive. The kappa is an interesting creature because it's really transformed over the years from this horrible, terrible folkloric monster to a really cute sort of children's character. The next one is the nekomata. This is one of Japan's many types of transforming animals that make up the yokai. You can tell that this is a nekomata and not a bake neko by the twin tails that is the signature of the nekomata. Now we get a little bit weirder with the yokai. This yokai here, this odd looking, odd looking thing that you see here is a monster that sneaks out at night and licks the ceiling. That's all it does. This yokai is known as a tenjo name and its name literally translates to ceiling liquor. This is Beto Beto San. Beto Beto San is the yokai personification of something of like walking alone on a dark night and feeling that something is walking behind you. And when you turn around, there's nothing there, but you can sense it, you can feel it. And there is something there, and it is the yokai Beto Beto San. And the way to get rid of the Beto Beto San that is following you around is to step to the side and say, after you, Beto Beto San, in which case it will walk on forward and not follow you anymore. This is the dread Onikuma, the demon bear. This shows that not all yokai are different types of magical creatures. Some are actual real animals that simply um, are a yokai version. The Oni Onikuma is a giant bear that's known to raid villages and haul off horses to eat. And this here is the keijoro, or basically what's known as the hair prostitute. Now the keijoro is a yokai of the later Edo period from the pleasure quarters. And the yoke, this story of the keijoro is the idea that you see this really beautiful woman from behind and she's shapely and her hair is lovely and you tap her on the shoulder and she turns around and she has no face, but oh, her entire body is made up of hair. Ah, it's very spooky. Yes, the Keijoro is literally the yokai embodiment of seeing someone who looks really, really sexy from behind. But when they turn around, you realize, ah, uh, okay, maybe they're not as hot in the front. And that's the yokai personification. Now, when looking at any word in Japanese, when I start to do a translation of it, one of the first places that I start is by attempting to dissect the kanji. Um, one of the things about written language, and this is kind of an aside from yokai, is that written language, and this is true of every written language on earth that I know, I'm sure there's exceptions out there, but I'm not sure, I'm not aware of them. Written language can do one of two things, but it can never do both at the same time. It can generally tell you either the pronunciation, it can tell you how something sounds, or it can tell you what something means. Uh, the Japanese writing system uses two different kinds of written language. It uses both. It uses uh, hiragana and katakana, which give you pronunciation. And it also uses kanji, which it took from China. And China, you know, kanji and gives you pronunciation, or it doesn't, sorry, kanji gives you meaning, but it doesn't give you pronunciation. So when we look at kanji, we can generally tell what something means by trying to sort of dissect it. So the first kanji there is yo. And it means something like, like mysterious, bewitching, unearthly, or weird. The bottom yokai, or the bottom kanji, is kai, which means mysterious, wondrous, strange. Kai shows up a lot. If you've ever seen like uh, the Godzilla movies, you know it's, it shows up in like kaiju. Um, 
it basically appears every time you're dealing with something strange or mysterious. But looking at the kanji, it doesn't really tell us a lot. Like we've got weird, weird. I mean, that's what the two kanji together mean. Um, so not a lot to go on there, except for we know we're in for something kind of magical. Now this combination of kanji, um, the first known appearance of it is in a Chinese book, the Zun Shi Zhuan, which is a first century text. And once again, we don't know how these kanji were pronounced at the time. It could have been an entirely different word than yokai. We just know that they appear. And it was used to say, like, this is sort of like describe a sense of unnatural anxiety and like foreboding, right? So in the book, it basically said the yokai was in the imperial court for a long time. And that could mean almost anything. It could mean sort of bad luck that they needed to dispel. Um, but it was certainly not a creature per se. It was more just a sense of something bad was happening. Now in English, there are a couple different uh, translations of yokai that people use. One of the most common is I think Japanese monster or demon. Um, and this is okay, it works. You know, I'll use this as the easiest translation, right? Because people understand it instantly. I much prefer Japanese monster to Japanese demon because I feel like demon has very specific judo christian negative contacts that does not happen in yokai, right? Yokai is a much more neutral term. It does not mean something evil. It does not mean something good. It does not mean something scary. It could mean something funny. And so demon has just a much more negative connotation than yokai does. Japanese monster, it's okay. Um, but again, as you'll see, not all of these monsters are in fact Japanese. Another possible translation of yokai, and this one is sort of older. Uh, you'll look and you'll see this more around the 1900s where they use the term bewitching apparition. And there's also just mysterious mm. phenomenon, right? Mm. So yokai can just sort of be anything mysterious. So let's look at the dictionary definition of yokai. So this is what I translated from the Japanese. Uh, and it says, yokai is a term encompasses oni, obake, strange phenomenon, monsters, evil spirits of rivers. Um, I won't read the whole thing out to you, but it could be legendary figures from Japanese folklore, purely fictional creations with little or no history. And there are many yokai that come from outside of Japan, including phenomena from outer space. And I think this last line is the most important. Anything that cannot be readily understood or explained, anything mysterious and unconfirmed can be yokai. And that is yokai to me. Yokai is everything that we don't know, everything that's outside of human knowledge. And not only that, but everything that just is outside of your own world, right? So when you're home alone and you hear a strange noise in another room, and you know no one's there, and you're pretty sure it's just the house making noises, but you don't know for sure, and it makes you a little scared. That's yokai, right? Um, when you're sitting here in your room, and you hear your cat meow, and you look down and your cat's at your foot, that's yokai. Uh, when you go swimming, and, and when you're out swimming in a lake and you feel something brush your leg and you look down and there's nothing there, that's yokai. Yokai is all of the experience that we don't know. So everything that we don't know is yokai. And so what that means is that while all of these are yokai, so are, by the, tech, the definition, all of these. Um, which is kind of why I personally like to use the term mysterious phenomenon for yokai. Although when translating, I generally just leave it as yokai. I think yokai is its own thing. And I think that it's come a long way and it's entered the English language to the extent that it really doesn't need a translation anymore. Now, something that I get asked a lot, and so I try to answer that is there's, people talk about different kinds of yokai. Um, it's something that, it's difficult to categorize, right? Because first off, yokai is folklore. It is not science. And so everything that is here is a little bit fuzzy, but these are the four categor categorizations of yokai as um, determined by Mizuki Shigeru, who is one of Japan's great yokai researchers. So he put that there are four different types of yokai. 
The first yokai is kaiju, which are monsters. And many people recognize the word kaiju from the Godzilla films, which are generally actually more like dai kaiju, which means giant monster. But kaiju are those yokai who are, they've always been yokai. They were never anything else. Like a kappa has always been a kappa. A kappa was never not a kappa. It was born a kappa, it dies a kappa. It's a kaiju, it's a monster. Henge, on the other hand, are your shapeshifters. They are the creatures or things that were one thing, but is now another. Like a nekomata, for example, was once an ordinary house cat, but it was a house cat that lived too long and it gained magical powers. And so that is a, a henge. Choshizen is what you would call super nature. So these are things that are of nature, but are a super version of it. Like you can have a yokai wind or a yokai wave or some sort of nature thing that there's a larger version of it. And finally, there is yure, which are ghosts. They are the dead. Another word for yokai, and you'll hear this a lot in Japan, is obakemono. It is just a substitute word for yokai. It doesn't mean anything different. One of the things I like about obakemono is it literally means changing thing, right? And that is because yokai change. They transform, um, not just from one thing to another, but over the history of Japan, they have become something new. And that's how they stay relevant with Japanese culture and with modern culture, because I believe yokai have really become part of world culture. So since that's our introduction done, since as I promised, we're doing a brief history of Japan, let's start. This is yokai in ancient Japan. This is what they looked like. Um, they weren't called yokai back then, but as you can see, they looked like nothing. They were invisible and formless. Um, I did see a question in chat. Can yokai translate into Japanese spirit? Sure, spirit is once again, just sort of another word that doesn't mean anything specific. And so that's a fine translation. Now, ancient Japan, there was a sort of belief system of elements, right? So you had elements of fire, water, earth, wind, and none of these were good or bad. They all have the potential to be either good or bad, right? The fire that warms you can burn you. The earth that gives you crops can shake and tear into pieces. And along with this also was the element of ki. Ki is just energy. And energy, once again, is neither good nor bad. It has the potential to be both, in fact. When ki is good, it can be worshipped, and it is something known as kami. When ki is bad or dangerous, then that is something that can be known as mono, or in the modern term of yokai, right? It is simply this idea that, that this energy has both the ability to be positive or negative. And a lot of it is determined on human interaction with this energy. Now, in ancient Japan, or in ancient China, as you saw also, like they used this kanji. This kanji sort of meant sort of like general, you know, that sense of general negative energy. Another term that was used at the time was mono. And I think that a lot of people will know this term in the modern sense of mononoke, which means sort of like things of mystery or things of wonder, uh, seen in the movie Princess Mononoke from Studio Ghibli and the director Miyazaki Hayu. Another term for yokai. And mononoke has very negative uh, connotations, right? Mononoke sounds kind of scary and sounds kind of evil. And that's how this energy, this formless magical energy was considered to be. And this energy existed in all of the places outside of human habitation, right? So the energy of Mononoke was up in the forests. It was in the deep dark places. It was inside the caves. It was out across the the ocean where Japan's fishing boats couldn't go because they didn't have ocean traveling boats. So basically anything outside of human existence was this magical, scary energy. A lot changed in Japan during the Asuka period of 552, where Japan got a visitor from overseas who came over from uh, what is now modern Korea, as well as China. In what we think is f around 552, uh, Kim Song of the Kingdom of Baekji, which I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that, so I hope I get at least a little bit right, sent an envoy to Japan, and they brought with them an image of the Buddha uh, Sakayamuni, right? And this was kind of an amazing thing for Japan because not only did it bring over this new religion of Buddhism, but it also brought over this concept of 
incarnate deities, right? Deities that had body, deities that had names and identity and individual uh, action, sort of, you know, they were personalities besides this sort of formless energy that had existed before of the kami of being positive and negative versions of nature. Uh, these deities were just more like people. Also that came along with this was the concept of monsters. This traveled mostly along the Silk Road. So you came down from India, you came down through um, China and Korea and came over to Japan. And they brought these things, like you can see over on the left here, like the Naga from India or the Huliling from China, the idea of a nine-tailed fox. And all of this came into Japanese culture. In Japan, I have to say, they really liked this, right? The idea of these gods and monsters was incorporated uh, by Japanese society. It was initially adopted by the Soga clan, uh, who took Buddhism and was like, all right, so they gain power using the, um, basically using Buddhism and all of these innovations that they had learned. In the Nara period, now one of the things that happens when a new religion enters a country, um, it tends to fight a war with the old religion and that's exactly what happened. Uh, basically, the introduction of Buddhism kicked off the Buddhism Shinto wars, which were fought between the Soga and the Fujiwara clan. Fujiwara clan emerged victorious. Uh, Soga clan basically represented Buddhism. Fujiwara clan represented uh, Shinto. Fujiwara emerged victorious, but it didn't mean that Buddha went away. You know, Buddhism went away. One of the interesting things in the Nara period is that they were left with this question of what was sort of the difference between this magical formless energy of Shinto and these sort of incarnate deities of Buddhism, like why did you have one and not the other? And so the idea came up of Matsudare Tenai Kami, which is basically this concept that human worship is one of the things that gives form to this formless energy. Um, they thought actually that perhaps the Kami themselves were in fact Buddha. And that led to the idea of uh, Jinguji, which is this sort of syncretic mixed version that emerged in the Nara period of both Buddhism and Shinto. They merged together and they started to live together in relative harmony, which they still do in Japan today. Now also, uh, moving on in the Nara period, we have the first known use of that kanji for yokai to appear in a Japanese text. Now, previously it had appeared in a Chinese text, but now we've actually got it appearing in a Japanese text in a book called the Shoki Nihongi. Now, it's used in the exact same way that it was used in the Chinese text, which is generally a sense of negative energy. Um, they rec recommend in the book a ritual cleansing of the palace to clear away the yokai. So once again, not a creature, it's still that earlier form of just sort of like negative magical energy that needs a sort of exorcist to come in and clean the room the same way that you would clean the room of dust and other parts that cling to, um, cling to a room, which is interesting also because actually dust that clings to a room would eventually become a personified yokai. We're gonna jump a couple centuries here because things start to move pretty fast, especially till we hit Edo. But in the Heian period, um, we start to see these myths and stories written down for the first time. The book, The Tale of Genji, was written in the 11th century uh, in the Yugao or Night Faces chapter. There is a lot of talk of the yokai known as Yure and Ikiro, which are different kinds of ghosts, as well as the ability of the human spirit to manifest outside the body. In around the 12th century, the book, The Konjaku Monogatari Shu is written. And this is probably the most important text written in Japanese supernatural literature. And a lot of the foundational stories from uh, Japanese literature, they're still told today, have their origin in the Konjaku Monogatari Shu. It was an attempt to collect the history and writings of three countries that were considered to be culturally significant at the time, which is China, India, and Japan. The first visual personification that we have of yokai, of 
uh, not as they were once again not as they were referred to as yokai at the time, but of any sort of Japanese monster. At least the first visual that we know of, of course, there's always the chance that there's older works that are lost through time. So we only know what survived, of course. But the Choju Jinbutsu Giga is a 12th century painting that shows a battle between animals. So here you have the first of what Mizuki Shigeru called the henge, which are the transformed animals. So we've got the frogs and the rabbits battling monkeys. And the Choju Jinbutsu Giga is this wonderful scroll that tells this story of all the different um, animals having their war. And this is, as I said, probably the first image of a personified version of what would later be known as yokai. Jumping ahead quite a long distance, we reach the Muromachi period. And the Muromachi period is so important in the evolution of yokai because something happens in the Muromachi period. This idea emerges that had not existed in previous eras. Like previous eras, once again, yokai are just kind of negative energy. They don't have bodies, they don't have names, they don't have personality. They're just bad vibes, they're just bad feelings. That's all they are. And you need an exorcist to come in and sort of wash away the bad energy and try and get some good energy in. Now in the Muromachi period, this idea comes um, that emerges from where, I don't think we really know, it's just a folk concept, but called the night parade of a hundred demons. And the idea is that on certain nights of the year, all of the yokai of Japan get together and they march. And they march in a big, long parade. And they mainly march down the imperial capital of Kyoto at the time. And when this night parade happened, because it was a real thing, and so you had um, court sorcerers named Omyoji who would sort of use their magic to determine when the night parade was happening because it was considered dangerous to go out on the night of the night parade. And there were certain rumors that happened that I think are actually kind of amusing about the night parade. Like there was the idea that the night parade could only be seen by people of royal blood. And so, you know, say that you were walking through the streets of Kyoto one day with, you know, your fellow prince and you might stop at a street and say like, oh, we must stop here. And the other prince is wise, like, oh, why the night parade is passing by. Can't you see them? And it was, you know, uh, maybe a little way to, sh one up your friend that you had royal blood and they didn't. But the interesting part of the night parade is that the idea of yokai marching means that they have to have feet. They have to have bodies, right? Because you can't have a parade of formless energy. And also with the night parade being so popular, artists started to create, to sell images of the night parade. And in order to do that, they had to have something to paint. They had to have something to draw. Now, most of these early scrolls, we don't know who the artists are. We don't really know where they got their ideas from, but we do know that the artists from the time started to sort of copy each other, right? So someone would come up with some really cool designs for the night parade, another artist, and everything was handmade at the time, right? There was no printing of these, there was no mass production. Each one was handmade by an artist. And so another artist might copy a different artist. And so you started to get the first yokai characters, right? You started to get the first ones that people could recognize. And when they recognized them, they also started to give them names. And so it was in the Muromachi period that yokai began to have individual identities, right? They started to have individual identities. They were still considered to be, however, invisible to normal people. Because remember, the night parade itself was invisible. But artists imagined that in this world of yokai, were they to be made visible, this is what they would look like. And I, I love this um, because so many of these yokais have entered into the pantheon, you know, they have names, they have identities, but not everyone was. And this little red blobby dude here is one of my favorite because he's one of the few yokai of the night parade that was never really named. Like they've actually given him a name uh, recently, I believe. That was actually even a toy made, which I thought was pretty funny because not all of these yokai became popular and little red blobby down there was kind of left out of the party. Another thing that happened in the Muromachi period was the Tsukomogami Eimaki. 
This was another scroll that came out, and this scroll dealt with the transformation of objects, right? So in the Tsukomogami Eimaki, there is a story that items that have been discarded and items that have, and this is specific that they are 100 years old, items that are 100 years old and are discarded can somehow gain sentience, right? So as you can see from the Tsukomogami Eimaki, these are all the different objects, right? So you see pots, you see chairs. Um, most of these, however, and this is um, something that has sort of like not transferred about the Tsukomogami Eimaki, is that many of these are actually symbols of Buddhism, right? Because you have a lot of vessels and the symbolism was that the human being is an empty vessel that can be filled with the wisdom of Buddha. And so that's where a lot of these Tsukomogami Eimaki pictures come from, as well as you see these prayer beads and things like that. Now, the original story of the Tsukomogami Eimaki is basically the same war that was fought in the Nara period, which is the premacy of Buddhism over Shinto. That is kind of the story that the Tsukomogami Eimaki is trying to tell. It's trying to tell the story of our God is better than your God. And the story is basically that in Kyoto, in the capital city, um, people have these objects that they've used for a hundred years and they throw them out into the street and they're discarded. And these objects, you know, once again, they're vessels, they're very symbolic objects. They gain sentience because that's the myth. And they go up into the mountains and they start to basically create a little society of these discarded objects. And they're very angry that they've been discarded, right? The Tsukomogami are, are quite evil. And they actually raise a Shinto shrine and they raise their own um, yokai kami, the Tsukomogami uh, kami that is their own god to worship and they come into kyoto and they do the sort of version of the night parade right carrying their god on a palaquin on their shoulder they charge into um, kyoto and they kill anyone they see they're invisible they're dangerous and they're ravaging the street of kyoto now what happens is that they come upon a um an aristocrat of person of nobility and they start to attack him but this person has an image of buddha on them and they flee before the image of buddha because they are they are the weaker deities right this is to show that shinto is the weaker deity to buddha uh this same aristocrat gathers a priest goes up into the mountains and the mountains are once again symbolic because the mountains are where the old shinto energy and deities live up in the mountains, out in the ocean. So he goes in the mountain, he confronts these Tsukomo, Tsukomogami Eimaki. The priest summons Buddha and all of his cohort to appear in physical form. The Tsukomogami themselves are odd. They, the empty vessels are filled with wisdom and they instantly convert to Buddhism. That's the story of Tsukomogami Eimaki. However, that story has almost entirely been lost and forgotten in the modern world and even not in the modern world but even by the Edo period um, most people sort of like they saw this story and like that's really great it's a good story but check out that umbrella with eyes on it right they really just like the characters and so they kind of just stripped the characters these idea of these embodied objects and they left all the teachings of Buddha behind because they didn't want that um, and they just went with the playfulness of these living objects, which is really what we have now in the modern era with things like, and even from the Edo period, you know, we have things like the Kaso Bake, which is this umbrella with a big eyeball and a wagging tongue. Um, and they just took the playfulness of the character design. And I think that that's one of the keys to survival for a yokai because character design really goes a long way. All right, we are now going to leap into the Edo period. Now the Edo period is really the grand uh, time of yokai. Up until now, in all the different periods, we've had a little bit of yokai, right? We've had just a dash here and there. In the Muromachi period, we had more. Um, but the Edo period is really where all of this spiritual potential, all of this potential that existed in Japan for 1,600 years finally coalesced into what we know as yokai today. And a lot of it is the confluence between three things. First off, which was kabuki theater that was invented in 1603. The other thing was mass market publication, uh, a printing press, 
arrived in the Edo period. Well, arrived, I should say, Japan actually invaded Korea and took it, but um, it was in Japan for the very first time. And so for the first time, you didn't have to have people hand painting scrolls, right? Everyone could get their own book, and that was amazing. Another thing in the Edo period was a parlor game called Hyaku Monogatari Kaidan Kai. And it was an incredibly popular game. It was basically what they would call a parlor game, where you would invite a bunch of your friends over and you would light a hundred candles. And each turn, someone would stand up and they would tell their own yokai story, right? And these yokai stories could be almost nothing, right? They could just be just a hint or a whisper of a story. They could just be something weird that happened to you. You know, they could be like, oh, the other day, um, I got up and it was raining outside. And so I got all dressed up and I put on my raincoat and I got my, you know, umbrella and I went outside and it was dry as a bone. It had the rain to drop. <sighs> Yokai, you've told your story. You lick your fingers. Psst, you put out one candle. And as everyone takes turn telling their stories, they put out another candle. And the room gets darker and darker with the extinguishing of each candle. And the mood gets scarier and scarier because the Kyako Monogatari is a test of courage, right? It sees how brave you are. And are you truly brave enough to put out that last candle to plunge the room into darkness? Because Kyako Monogatari was also a rite of evocation. And it was said that whoever put out the last candle would summon a yokai into the room. And as many people say, no one ever was brave enough to put out that last candle. As I said, mass media was one of the triggers for the yokai boom. Ah, uh, yes, the story of the Al Ando, exactly as someone noticed. The Al Ando is the yokai that waits in the dark at the end of Hyaku Monogatari. Um, we had mass, or Japan had mass market publications for the first time. So the Wakan Sanzai Zue was made, which is this encyclopedia. And this, this encyclopedia contained all sorts of records of natural objects as well, of various animals, of things that could be found, but it also included yokai. And it included yokai alongside other animals as if they were real, right? So you had an entry for a monkey, and you also had an entry for someone like this. And this is actually the oldest known drawing of a kappa. So that is what a kappa would originally have looked like. It's very hairy, as you can see. It's quite different from modern interpretations of the kappa, but it appeared in the Wakan Sansei San, San, San Zue. Now, a key factor in the evolution of yokai also was Sawaki Sushi. Um, and he did a painting called the Hyaki Zukan. And this was very similar to the Muromachi picture scrolls of the night parade of a hundred demons, except for Sawaki's version was not actually a night parade. It was something that we would recognize now as a yokai bestiary, which showed different yokai. So we have the Nuke Kubi over here, as well as a picture of the Inugami. And he just painted the different types of yokai. And he gave them all names. And that's pretty key, right? So you actually had this scroll that was just a bunch of different types of named yokai. So now they had very specific names. Some of their names have actually changed over time. As you can see, the uh, Nuke Kubi over there is now known as the Dokurokubi. So um, not all of these names have passed into time, but these are the ones that Soaki Sushi gave them. But Sushi's Emaki, his, um, his scroll, it was still a single one-off hand-painted version. What really was the game changer was when an artist named Toriyama Sekin arrived. And he did a book called the Gazu Shakai Yagyo. And he took a lot of Sushi's designs and he reproduced them. He created some of his own and he did it in a form that was printed. So Toriyama Sekian's book was mass market. So it wasn't a one-off, which meant that a lot of people could get a copy, right? And he took some of Sushi's designs. He also did his own interpretation. Um, Toriyama basically like gathered 
all of these different yokai stories and characters. Um, he wrote little poems to go along with some of them, and he printed the Gazu Hyaki Yagyo. Uh, and it was a huge hit. It was very popular. So his publishers did what publishers always do when they have a hit on their hand, and they asked for a second volume. And Toriyama Seikin was only happy to oblige. He created the Konjaku Gazu Zoku Hyaki, which was the second volume in his series. And this, once again, he went through and he gathered various yokai. Um, we have like a ningyo over here, the Japanese mermaid. Um, and he put all of these together in this book. Once again, you have an illustration done by Sekin. You have the name there. Um, there's often like a little explanation. Sometimes it's an allegory. Sometimes it's sort of a story that relates to uh, or is a comment on an earlier text. Um, they're actually quite complex and beautiful. And they were also meant to be slightly comedic. Um, Toriyama Seikian's books were often, I guess you would say they were possibly the start of yokai as pop culture, you know? So if you're looking for an origin for something like Pokemon and the Pokedex, this is really where you'll find that origin because he wasn't taking them too seriously. They were a little cheeky, you know? Um, and the second book, once again, equally popular, super popular. And the publishers are like, hey, Sekian, you're making us money. We're making you money. We like money. So let's do some more of these great yokai encyclopedias. And Toriyama Sekian's like, absolutely, yes, can do. But Sekian has a problem. He is completely out of yokai. He has no more stories to tell. He has no more people to copy. Um, and so from the third and fourth volumes on, the Konjaku Hyaku, Hyaki Shui, as well as the Gazu Hyaki um, Tsudezure Bukuro, they are just Toriyama's invention. He just starts making stuff up, right? He just starts making up yokai entirely from his own creation, putting them in these books, they are shelved alongside these other books, which were, I guess, what you might call authentic folklore and that they were older stories he had gathered. But for the next two volumes, he just starts making them up. Um, and many people will often ask me this question. I get question, asked this question all along, like, is this a real yokai? You know, is such and such a real yokai, like from this manga series or from this anime? And my answer to that is always yes. I mean, what is a real yokai? Does it matter? that a yokai was created specifically and only to sell books because that's why Toriyama created these. He created these, you know, all, not all, but many yokai that we know today specifically come from this origin of wanting to sell some books. Um, and that's, that's cool. I like the Keiku Kagan over there in the right. I actually mentioned him a little bit earlier in that the old idea of yokai was negative energy that needed to be swept out like dust in the corners of the room. Well, Sekian decided that that dust in the corner of the room was actually a yokai. And so that's what you have there. You have the yokai of dust in the corner of the room. Um, there's the keijoro, the hair prostitute that I showed earlier in the introduction. And Toriyama, like Sekian, his ideas were, um, he didn't always have great ideas, I have to say. Some of them are really great. But another one you see there, there's a woman and she's kind of stretching. And her name is just Tall Woman, Taka Ona. That's all you get. He puts no other story in there. He just drew a picture and uh, he must have just been fresh out of ideas. So he just wrote Taka Ona. He just wrote Tall Woman. Um, later, other artists gave Taka Ona her own story, which is kind of funny because that happens all the time too. Later, writers and artists will come and fill in the gaps and layer on more stories to these creations. Now, one of the reasons why his books sold so well, because was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was because of the Hyakumanoka Tare Kaidankai, which was such a massively popular game, but people didn't really have that many stories. And so they would buy manuals and books um, to try and get stories to tell during wow. these gatherings. And yokai, all these yokai publications, just there's so many of them during the Edo period that is really fueled by both this game and also by Kabuki Theater. 
because Kabuki theater at the time would also tell the best and the most famous stories that were being told at these um, gatherings, and they would actually storify them even more, right? They would take these stories and they would give them more personality and make them complete stories from the fragments that they are. Also with the mass market at the time, you have these kibiyoshi, these yellow books that are being published, right? And these yellow books are building, all of this is building on each other. So you have all of these different parts of Japanese culture in this dance with each other, with the game, Hyakumonogotari Kaidankai, with Kabuki theater, with the yellow books, you know, the mass market publication, and they're all supporting each other and they're all building each other to create this wonderful world of yokai. And so many yokai are created during the Edo period. Now, all of the fun of yokai comes to the end um, during the Meiji period. So the Meiji period, America shows up in Japan with these giant black ships, and we've got cannons and steam engines, and basically, you know, forces Japan into the modern world. And one of the things that they learn from Western societies is the concept of science and industry versus superstition and magic that had dominated much of Japan during the Edo period. They also learn about things like psychology. And they learn that these Western powers, they don't believe in fairy tales. They don't believe in these stories. They're mostly considered to be children's fairy tales. And so as people sort of study this, they transform yokai from being monsters to what they would call shinke, which is basically nervous disorders. Like they literally will say that if you believe in yokai, you are insane at this point. In fact, one person, Inoue Inryo, who is known as the first yokai hakase, the first yokai doctor, right? He comes in, and, or Professor Yokai, he invents the study of yokai gaku, yokai ology, and he writes the yokai gaku koji, kogi, which is this series of lectures that he lectures on yokai, but it's specifically about why yokai aren't real, right? Enryo is a debunker. His role in this story is basically to take yokai and to prove how they don't exist, how yokai are nothing more than astral phenomenons or just strange human behavior and that they're not real and that Japan needs to do away with yokai. Japan needs to move into the modern world, which Enryo is right. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that the, in this story of yokai, Enryo is often made out to be the villain because his role was basically to purge yokai from Japan. But, um, you know, he also was, you know, very correct in the move towards science away from superstition and the move towards medicine away from folk practices uh, is something that he supported. On the other side of that was Yanagito Kunio. And he actually saw something in yokai as something that was valuable and important and the core of Japanese culture. And he wanted to preserve it in a way that Enryo did not. Enryo believed that Japan needed to put away its past and move into the future. Uh, Yanagito believed that Japan needed to preserve its past. And so he actually went um, with another folklore re researcher up into the mountains of Tono, up into north, and he basically gathered as many um, oral stories as he could to write them down before they disappeared. Yanagita, Yanagita Kunio is very much, and was actually inspired directly by the Grimm's brothers, who did the same thing in Germany, gathering these folk legends that they saw as vanishing and putting them in a book form that could be preserved forever. All right, the Meiji period, gives way to the Showa period. Now the Showa period is when yokai really transform into pop culture, right? Uh, and I had said earlier that Sekian was kind of the early grains of that, but in the Showa period, because we've gone through the Meiji period where yokai have generally been pushed off the stage, right? And they've been taken out of the schools, they've been taken out of the plays. In fact, even Kabuki theater plays, if they did plays on uh, that involves supernatural, they often would have to give like a little sort of speech saying like, obviously this is just fantasy. No one believes that these stories are true. Now in the Showa period, there was a form of entertainment called kamishibai, which were these basically traveling storytellers who kept a little box on their back, which was a paper theater. And they would go from town to town and they would sort of tell these stories. And these stories had various characters. Like this is Oregon Bat, who is this skull face sort of superhero figure modeled off of the Phantom of the Opera. Um, and in these 
Kamishibai stories, these old yokai stories started to reappear. And, you know, as Enyoe had pushed them out from most of Japanese society in the Showa period, they start to come back. And that's m mostly thanks to this guy here, who is Mizugi Shigeru. Now, Mizugi Shigeru was also, after Kamishibai, he became a comic book artist. And his comic book, Kitaro, was really the key book that transformed all of these yokai stories and put them in the pop culture and also taught them to a new generation of Japanese children. And they were put in comics in a form that was a little more, I guess you could say, harmless than before because they were now children's entertainment. They transformed basically the same way that fairy tales had in uh, sort of European culture as well as American culture from being something people actually actively believed in and were afraid of into something that was simply told to children. And so that's what he did with Kitado. Now, Kitado was a massive hit. It was so popular in Japan that it kicked off what's known as the Showa period yokai boom. So the Showa period yokai boom, based on the fame of Kitado, everyone started making their own yokai stuff. And a lot of comic book versions of classic yokai tales came out, such as the Yuki Onna, or you can see the Yotsuya Kaidan over there, which is the tale of Oiwa, which is possibly Japan's most famous ghost. Also in the Showa period, we started to have new yokai appear. Um, this is one of those things that many people would disagree on. I firmly consider Godzilla to be a yokai, uh, as a yokai of the Showa period. Um, some will disagree about kaiju and yokai, but that's just my point. I feel that, you know, and, and yokai were often based, and that, as I said a little bit earlier, is that yokai are obakemono, they are the changing things, right? What keeps them relevant to Japanese society and world culture is their ability to adapt. And as new fears appear, and Godzilla is very much the yokai of the atomic bomb, right? He is the personification of the atomic bomb, and that's how he appeared first in Japan. Also in the Showa period, another very important yokai artist was Rumiko Takahashi and her series Urusei Yatsura. Urusei Yatsura completely transformed, as you can see there, the girl in the little tiger bikini is an oni, which was once Japan's most terrifying monsters, and Takahashi recreated oni as this cute girl. And Takahashi went a long way to starting what I consider to be sort of the cutification of yokai. Even back in Mizugi's time, like Mizugi was doing yokai, but they weren't cute. You know, they were still ugly and they were still scary and they were still, you know, something that was sort of grotesque. But by the time that Takahashi steps on the stage, she's now transformed yokai into something delightful, into something you would want to meet, into something really fun. And other artists followed in the Takahashi vein. So you have like, that book in the middle there, Kappa no Kai Kata, right? That Kappa is darling. There is nothing scary about that Kappa at, at all. That book is actually called How to Raise a Kappa, and it's about the idea of Kappa as pets. Um, you also have things like Rise of Nura, Rise of the Yokai Clan, Takahashi did Inuyasha, um, and Yokai really flourished and transformed during the Heisei period. Also during this period, you see Yokai sort of leaving Japan and going into world culture. These are three very famous uh, Western comics. The comic Wayward, which full disclosure I work on, so you know it's kind of self-serving there. But hey, Wayward's a great comic, so go ahead and check it out. Um, Monstrous, which did an entire sweep of the Eisner Awards a few years back uh, by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda, is very much a yokai-influenced comic that has Nekomata as main characters. It's a beautiful comic and heavily yokai-influenced. Stan Sakai put out the comic book Usagi Ojimbo Yokai. And I, also, as you see, I think it's interesting with Usagi Ojimbo Yokai is that at this point, Yokai has entered the English language enough to where it doesn't necessarily need a translation. And of course, you can't talk about Yokai in the modern world without the phenomenon that is Demon Slayer. Um, Demon Slayer is easily the most popular manga in the world right now. Uh, and it deals with Oni, and it deals with much of Japan's folkloric past. In fact, all the way into the modern era with the Reiwa period, Yoka, uh, Demon Slayer was just released in um, American theaters this weekend. It absolutely was a 
phenomenal hit. It um, finally knocked Hayazaki Mio's films out as the top earner in Japan. And it is absolutely introducing yokai to an entirely new generation in its own way. Also in the Reiwa period, I think this, this was something I was able to attend that was really fascinating, is in Sydney, Australia, they had this massive exhibition of yokai artwork. <clears throat> from across, you know, they gathered some of the most famous and wonderful works of art and held this massive exhibition in Sydney. And it was incredible to, to participate in because I'm driving through the city of Sydney, which is this major metro, metropolis, metropolis uh, big city. I can't think of the word right now. But anyway, and there's yokai banners everywhere. The whole city is covered in yokai art. It's like, wow, what an amazing transformation. I mean, even just to watch that happen from when I first started studying yokai, you know, back in like early 2000s where nobody knew what it was to where they are now. And I think very much a part of world culture. Also as part of this exhibition, the artist Murakami Takeshi, who is easily Japan's most famous modern artist, was asked to commission an original piece of art for the exhibition. And this is the piece that he created. What I love about this piece so much, as well as just the fact that um, Murakami Takeshi is a stunning artist, is that he's done what I think most yokai researchers have done over the years. And it's one of the things that keeps yokai real and alive. Is that, yes, he has gathered all of these observable and famous yokai from Japanese history. You know, he has Bakeneko there. You know, he has a couple different forms of cats as well, of magical cats. Um, it looks like he's got a Hyosube down there in the corner. Uh, there's an Inogami tucked down over there, which is clearly a nod to Sushi's earlier scroll that I showed. So he's gathered all these yokai, but he's also added a few new ones, you know, that aren't as recognizable, that are pretty much his own creation. And I think that that's great because he's basically following in the footsteps of Toriyama Sekian, who whenever you're an artist who's creating yokai, I feel like you're almost not obligated, but you, you add your own verse to the story, right? You add in new elements, you add in new flavor because the obakemono are the changing things, right? Because the night parade of a hundred demons marches on and the way for it to march on and keep marching on, the way for yokai to keep mattering is for them to keep being re reinvented. You know, they're not just something that is preserved in the past. When you study yokai, it's not enough to look backwards. You have to look forwards too. You have to study the present and you have to study the future because yokai are not simply something from the Edo period. They are of the modern world um, and will continue to be of the modern world. I honestly believe that as long as we have something called Japan on the earth that there will continue to be yokai and possibly even longer. And that brings us to our last yokai, which is my favorite yokai of the modern age, which is the Amabie. So the Amabie also just shows the amazing transformative power of yokai and how much they do still matter because the Amabie first appeared and you see this Kawaraban over on the left. It was this artifact from the Edo period that we have and nobody really knows that much about it, but it was one of many form of prophetic yokai who basically appeared and said something like, you know, like, oh, there's going to be a pandemic, um, but if you show my picture, disaster will be averted. And artists sort of rediscovered the Amabie and just went with it. And now Amabie is easily one of the most recognizable symbols of the coronavirus, of COVID, of the pandemic. You see artists making Amabie art everywhere. And once again, this has spread worldwide. If you go on Twitter, if you go on the internet and you search for Amabie, you will see artists all over the world. And I shouldn't just say artists, you'll see people all over the world because I, I drew an Amabie and I'm a terrible artist. But you know, it gave you this sense of connection and this sense of shared human experience to be able to draw at Amabie and to contribute to this. And it was all because of this yokai. And in Japan recently, it's been amazing to watch this transformation because as I said also in the early part of the presentation, what is one of the differences between kami and yokai is that one is worshiped and one is not. 
And Amabie have recently been seen being enshrined at Shinto Shrine. And so because of this worldwide worship and love of the Amabie, the Amabie itself has gone from, I mean, absolute obscurity where if you were talking about in January of 2020, almost nobody had ever heard of the Amabie to currently where the Amabie is world famous and is now being elevated by that fame and worship to being a kami in Japan instead of a yokai. So that is the end of my time and the end of my presentation. I just wanted to put this up here in case anyone wants to contact me uh, later. I'm definitely able to have some questions and stuff if people want to ask some questions by all means that I don't know how much time we have but um, people are welcome to ask me some questions. Oops, I lost my little chat there when I lost the Zoom but I'll pop these back up. But that is my website as well as Twitter. I am on Twitter kind of too much so if you want to pop on and say hi, the only thing I kind of ask is just say like just tag me and be like, hey, I saw your presentation. So that way I know where, I, where you know me from. So that's about it. So yeah, thank you all so much. Um, do we have time to get to a couple questions? Is that okay? Yes, Sarah, yes, or? we have uh, some time. Thank you okay. very much uh, for this amazing presentation. I think you, you gave a really great overview mm -hmm. of this topic. Thank you, and sorry for, it looked like we had a little bit of a Zoom glitch there, but I'm glad that, uh, yes. that it worked. So, okay, so there's, I see a couple questions in here. One of them that- um, Yes, King so Kong that, can be considered as a new yokai, asks so Alessandro Scaramuccia. Can, can King Kong be considered as a new yokai? So that is such a great question because, I mean, my own personal answer to that is sure. I mean, yes, why not? It's a giant monkey. You know, why couldn't that be a new yokai? But I also know other people, there's other people that, that define yokai much more strictly. You know, like I've, I've seen a few people who they're like, oh, yokai have to become from Japan and they have to be something, you know, like organic and not created for commercial purposes. But I think, well, many yokai didn't come from Japan and many yokai were created for commercial purposes. So what's the difference from King Kong? So I, I tend to think with a very broad spectrum of yokai, that yokai is, is simply a word that covers a lot of different things. You know, like yokai could even cover some of the different mascots, you know, I mean, heck, one of the yokai, um, Tofu Kozu, for example, he's a little boy who carries a plate of tofu. Nobody knows for sure, but many people kind of think that he was once the mascot for a tofu shop in the Edo period. And if a mascot for a tofu shop in the Edo period can enter the yokai pantheon, now he has this great story about him. He's the son of Nirariho and it's all this like great mythology that's been built around. Who was somebody, just a cute drawing of a kid carrying tofu that a tofu shop probably painted on their marquee at some point. So why not King Kong? The next uh, question yeah. is from uh, Nicole Genovese. Mm -hmm. Mr. Davison, what do you think of the animated film Spirited Away since it features some yokai examples? Yeah, I love Spirited Away and I think that Spirited Away does the best job of any um, film that I've seen of showing that duality of yokai nature, right? Because, you know, looking back at the older version of yokai and with the kami nowadays in Japan is that there is none that is simply good or evil. Uh, every spirit every kami is known to have two faces both the rough face and the gentle face and a lot of ritual in japan a lot of celebrations are built on trying to make sure that it is the gentle face that appears and not the rough face right you want to keep your kami happy and i think spirited away really shows that duality and you have all of these things in um, spirit away who have both the ability to heal and harm right like the the river god, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but you know, he's all dirty and he's filthy. Um, you know, he's a god of filth. But once they clean him off, he now is pure. You know, he is pure water from dirty water. And that is very much a part of Japanese religion and spirituality is this idea of duality. And you see that in Spirited Away more than any other film. Then Ludovica. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the Yokai's parade in Satoshi Kon's Paprika? Oh, it's, yeah, mm. it's, it's awesome. Um, 
I mean, I love it. I, anytime I, you see an animated version of the Night Parade, I think it's great. Like the, uh, the Night Parade in Pompoco is also one of my absolute favorites <laughs> because it shows the Tanuki manifesting as all of the different uh, yokai. And, I, you know, I translated Satoshi Kon's manga as well. So I just, I dearly love Satoshi Kon and everything that Satoshi Kon worked on is just absolutely wonderful. Then we have Bad Pizza mm -hmm. said, uh, I recently watched uh, the anime Mononoke and the characters always distinguish the term Mononoke from Ayakashi. What's the difference? Yeah, that's a really interesting question too, because the term Ayakashi has really changed in modern language from what it used to be. Um, in the oldest days, Ayakashi specifically referred to sea monsters. It was a special word for monsters from the ocean. But in modern terms, it's really, um, it's really kind of changed. And I think that that's, it shows the use of language, how language can change over time. And I mean, what is the difference? There's a real like difference, right? It's like someone said earlier, you know, it's like, can you call a yokai a spirit? I mean, what's the difference between a spirit and a monster? You know, I mean, they're, they're sort of like, truly nebulous words that you can fit whatever context or meaning into them. And none of them is very exact because yokai are, as I said, folklore and not science. So none of these terms are going to be exact. Ayakashi, um, mononoke, obakemono, um, they're all sort of different words, but they have, a, you know, they can have a different tone and nuance to them. And I think that actually Miyazaki went a long way to presenting mononoke as being a pleasant term, where it used to be considered to be a very negative term, right? So he's sort of, with Prince Mononoke, he's transformed mononoke from being something really evil to being something almost fairy-like and gentle, which it didn't used to be. Thank you for your answer. Then we have Andrea. You talked about sensations. Can some yokai somehow have been a way to express feeling, emotions, or fears in a metaphorical way in order to not to mention them directly? Huh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that I have an exact answer for that. I mean, they, yokai are definitely, some yokai, and this is not all, some are definitely going to be personification of feelings and emotions um, or fears, such as even the personification of Beto Beto-san, of that thing behind you, you know, or, you know, um, but I don't know that they're not necessarily a way to not express them directly. I think they're just, you know, the idea is, is that you have this sort of like magical energy and human beings can sort of forge it into something with strong emotions or powerful sensations. Um, and they are the ones who personify this yokai. So you could do it that way, but I don't necessarily think that traditionally that's been the use of yokai as a way of um, avoiding confronting things. But it's more just like, you were scared of something or, you know, you had this rage in you and then that manifested as yokai. There's a lot of stories of yokai that build on rage, by the way, of people who are just so angry that they transform into yokai. There's also a lot that are filled on greed and sort of like negative emotions that transform into yokai. And we have uh, Maria Alessio. Mm -hmm. Uh, for pretty obvious reasons, Japanese media has been talking about the Amabie a lot recently. Are there many other yokai associated with the disease and epidemics? Do you have some uh, suggested resources about uh, this topic? Great question. And yes, there are a lot. In fact, um, there are, gosh, how many? I know of like maybe 15 or 20 off the top of my head that are associated with uh, disease and epidemics. And they all came around at roughly the same time, right? So that's one of the interesting parts of the Amabie is that there are Japan has so many of these types of yokai, and they're all fairly, they're yoga and yokai, so they're prophetic yokai, and they are fairly similar in story. Um, but, like the Jinja Hime, for example, is this long fish woman. The Amabie was the one of all of these that was sort of chosen by the world, you know, the one that people resonated with to represent um, all of these prophetic yokai. And I really think it was her hair. I think that the Amabie has such beautiful, long flowing hair. And that was so much fun for artists to draw. And the Amabie is cute. And so that's why of all of these epidemic yokai, Amabie was the one to, to strike a chord with everyone. I think that it's just the pretty hair, you know? Because um, it is fun to draw. If you're going to draw on Mabie, you might as well, you know, you spend a lot more time on the hair. 
Um, suggested resources on this topic. I've actually got uh, a little sort of like mini book on Amambier. If you, you know, hit me up on Twitter and I can send you a link to it um, afterwards. Actually, I could probably send a link to it now, but that's a little effort to go find. So I will try to do that while we are talking here on the next question. Yes, the, ne the next question is uh, from Gaia. I have a very big passion for yokai and old legends. Is it possible to find a job related to them? Is it difficult? <laughs> uh, yes, it is very difficult to find a job related to yokai. Um, the vast majority of jobs related to yokai are going to be either, you know, as a professor or if you're someone like myself, you know, you can write books. I popped a little thing to the Amabie book in there. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's not an easy thing to make a career out of for sure. Um, you're, but if you can do it, tell me how, and I will be right there with you. All right, so I okay. see the next question coming up. The next up. question is uh, Kia, uh, from Chiara. Mm -hmm. The tango can be considered a yokai of which group? It's a so, hange, kaiju, or something else. I would put, if I was to classify the Tengu, I think of it as more of a Kaiju, right? Because the Tengu has not transformed from anything. It has always been a Tengu. There was never, although that's not necessarily true because there's definitely one story of an emperor who in his rage was transformed into a Tengu. So there'll probably be a few different variations there. Um, but I personally think of Tengu, um, from what I know of them, as being more of the Kaiju because they, they've always been Tengu, you know, they are born Tengu, they die Tengu, with some rare exceptions in there. Then we have Amadori. How 20th century tragedies and crimes such as murders contributed to fuel the yokai culture? Oh, absolutely. I mean, any time that you have things like death or murder, um, it can easily contribute to yokai culture. I think one of the most famous examples that is definitely a part of modern yokai culture is the junkai or the sea of trees the suicide woods of mount fuji which have become very famous um, in a negative way they've unfortunately actually attracted tourists to the point to where but it's a place where people in japan go to commit suicide and there's this legends that have come up of the forest itself and so this once again would be part of that yokai category called choshi zen which is super nature you have a forest itself that is affected with years of people committing suicide. And so when you go in there, it, their legends are that you're essentially compelled to kill, to kill yourself from going in there. So all of that is affected. Um, I think that things like that tend to affect yokai culture more than a specific murder. Um, although you do see certain characters coming up, you know, from famous murders that have almost achieved yokai status. Um, I know of a few, child murderers in Japan, um, specifically the girl named Nevada-tan, who you'll see artwork of her now. And I would not be surprised if give it another hundred years, if someone's creating a yokai bestiary, to see some of those um, murderers appearing as yokai. I mean, that's kind of, it's a way of the cultures of processing tragedy, of course, but it's also just the way that yokai culture works. You know, when enough people start to believe it, then it personifies in the same way that um, Aokigahara has this, you know, the suicide woods of Mount Fuji. Thank you. The next question is uh, from Francesca. What do you think about the spirit's representation in the anime Dororo? So, great question. And this is one of those things where I'm going to have to say, you know, I haven't really seen much of Dororo. I've read some of the manga. I think Dororo is such an interesting comic because of where it is in history, because it was done by the comic artist um, Osamu Tezuka, and Tezuka was extremely jealous of Mizuki Shigeru's success, right? Mizuki Shigeru created uh, Kitaro, which was immensely successful. It was so popular and remains immensely popular in Japan today, and Tezuka was like, well, anything you can do, I can do better. And so he created Dororo as a way to challenge Mizuki and to show that he could do a yokai that was even better than Mizuki. And then it wasn't, it wasn't better. And so Tezuko actually wrote in his um, introduction to it, he's like, I failed, you know, I had to admit defeat that Mizuki Shigeru is the one and only true master of yokai. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The next question is from Julia. Uh, if you uh, do, you have have you ever had the occasion to study or compare also Ainu folklore or traditional creatures of Hokkaido or Sakhalin too? That's a great question, and unfortunately, no, I haven't. Like, I know um, very little about Ainu folklore, um, aside from sort of the basics of it, as well as the bear cult and bear worship, but I really have not made that a focus area of study. It's something that I think is really interesting. I would love someone to write that book, and I would absolutely be the first person to buy it. So, uh, you know, Julia, if you want to make that study, let me know, and I will absolutely buy that book, because I think that would be an interesting thing to read. Then we have Cynthia. Some yokai are born from a phenomena that people cannot really explain, but the yokai are not uh, necessarily scary, right? Is it possible that yokai made the reality less scary by giving form to unknown things? Uh, yes, in a way. I mean, that is one of the ways that people, you know, you can, you can make something less scary or more scary by sort of personifying it. But also, a lot of yokai are just things that are weird. They're not all fear-based. There are some things that are scary. Like one of my favorite yokai is called the, um, the foot washing mansion. And it's literally just this elegant, beautiful lady owns this house that occasionally a giant dirty foot steps down from the ceiling and her staff comes out and they clean the foot and then it goes away. I mean, a lot of them are literally just kind of weird. So I think that it's, it's a mistake sometimes to think of yokai as always being some personification of fear. Because yes, they are sometimes, but certainly not all the time. In fact, I think yokai is being some sort of like manifest manifestation or uh, built from fear. I think that's actually more rare of yokai. Okay, then we have Julia. What do you think about uh, the Yuki Onna, or in general about all those yokai that appear as a woman? So um, I love Yuki Onna. She's got a special place in my heart because my wife's name is Miyuki and her wife name's uh, Beautiful Snow in Japanese. So I always think of my wife when I hear about the Yuki Onna. But um, you know, it's, this is something that I also, a question I also get a lot of, you know, there's this idea that yokai are mostly women and that's actually not true um if you look at the yokai the majority of yokai are actually male presenting as it is you know you see a lot more of them but you don't see as many of them and this i don't really know why but in film you know in movies like ningu and in movies like juan and things like that movies like quite on they tend to focus on the women yokai and that is also true of kabuki theater kabuki theater when they started doing yokai legends, they started presenting the, um, the women ones, women-based ones, such as uh, Yotia Kaidan with Oiwa. And so I think that there's more, they're more in the public perception, but if you actually look at the wide world of yokai, there are actually women yokai are kind of in the minority, but I think they just make visually better or something like that, you know? Um, and it's also interesting, especially films like Juon. Like Juon, people talk about the women ghosts, but Juon has three ghosts and two of them are men and only one of them are women. But, uh, you know, the other two, the guy and the sun ghost, um, just aren't talked about as much, even though they are very much a part of the film. Yu Hong asks uh, if uh, it is possible to find some examples similar to yokai in the Western culture. Oh, absolutely. I mean, every country has its own folklore. Like where I am in Washington here in the United States, our local yokai would be Bigfoot, right? Um, I think, and that was something that Mizuki Shigeru actually was very, was a big proponent of is he went, he did what he called his world yokai tour, where he actually toured the world learning about all these different folklore. And so he created these books that he called his world yokai encyclopedias. And they were basically to teach the children of Japan about all of these yokai across the world. And I'm sure that almost every place in the world has their own yokai, right? Because like even where I live in my neighborhood, a few houses down, we have a house that we call the cookie house. And it's got its own rumor because, um, you know, someone lived there that committed suicide. And so all these families that move in, they tend not to live there very long. And so like when someone buys the house, the neighbors will walk out and it's like, oh, did you see someone bought the cookie house? You know, it's like, oh, I wonder how long. So that is yokai, right? Like any local legends, if you walk down, a, you know, a certain street where there's a certain bell or a certain building or something like that, every culture has their own version of yokai. 
Um, I like the next question a lot. I can actually see it there. <laughs> Have you ever created your personal yokai? Absolutely. Um, as I thought that, as I said earlier, you know, I think that it's a job of yokai researchers to not just research, but to add. And so in my book, um, Yokai Stories that I wrote, I very specifically created a new yokai too, because I wanted to um, continue Sekian's tradition and add something new to the pantheon. But also continuing Sekian's tradition, I don't tell you which is the new one that I created. So you kind of have to read the book and it's up to you to guess um, which is the new yokai invention that I added. Okay, and then what about yokai in live Japanese, live Japanese movies? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously technology has caught up to where yokai can much more appear in live action Japanese movies. There's quite a lot that come out. Um, not as many of them get translated, uh, but I really like the Showa period ones, like the, what they called them, like the Hunter or Spooks Warfare, I think they were in English. The special effects are actually kind of bad, but I like that. Um, and you'll see lots of yokai that appear in like the Ultraman series, you know. Once again, I would classify them Godzilla's as yokai as well. Um, and there's several great live action Kitaro movies where the yokai are just fantastic. So, uh, oh, Miike Takeshi's Great Yokai War. I think they're actually making a new version of the Great Yokai War, I believe. And that, that'll be the third remake of that film. So that would be pretty exciting. Um, this next question, and I think I can only take a few more questions, so we'll get, move through these. Um, yes. Is there a modern yokai about existing yokai? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of them in Japan, um, for sure. I also recommend, uh, my friend Matthew Myers runs the website yokai.com, where he is an artist. He lives in Japan, and he has his own art, um, artistic version of yokai. So yokai.com is a great resource to just go learn a little bit more about yokai. Uh, once again, full disclosure, I actually edit his books and series. So, you know, I'm involved in that too. But uh, Matt, Matt Myers is probably the best one I know of in English. In Japanese, there are a ton of them. Mizuki Shigeru's books are absolutely phenomenal. I really hope to be able to translate them someday. I know that his books have been translated into French and Spanish. I'm not sure about Italian. Uh, European languages actually tend to get better manga translations than the West, sadly. But uh, yeah. Uh, May I ask you the next question? Yeah. What advice would you give to students to pursue their studies on Japanese folklore and through what lens? I mean, through, for example, early modern, pre-modern Japanese literature or uh, through, for example, Japanese paintings? Because um, I see in uh, your slides many, many Kanban texts and the Japanese prints. So what is the best uh, methodology to conduct this type of uh, research uh, in this contemporary period? So I, this is always a hard question to answer because my answer is not an easy one. Um, I honestly think that the best way is to learn Japanese and move to Japan. And I realized that that's not an easy thing to do, right? It's not easy to say, oh yeah, I'll do that. You know, let me just put that on my schedule. But that is the only, you know, that is what I did. Like I studied a lot of stuff outside of Japan before I moved to Japan. And I realized when I got there how limited my studies have been because it was basically what some Western publishers had found that they thought they could make money off of. And so that, you know, is what they got translated to. But then you get to Japan and you're like, wow, we only, we only know like a tiny little percent here. You know, we only get like 1% and there's so much more. So if you really want to deep dive into yokai, if you really, or anything in Japanese culture, sorry, someone wants to make a guest appearance. So I guess that um, it's time for Mochi to show up. But if you really want to, uh, to, to learn more, there's really no substitute. Like I can only tell you so much, um, but if you speak Japanese, if you move to Japan, there's just, a, that's where it is, you know, you just kind of have to go to it instead of expecting it to go to you. So thank you very you much go, for your answer. Say, say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> Bye, Mochi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. If anyone doesn't have any other questions, I would like to thank you again, Zach, for your lecture and for being unfortunately only virtual <laughs> with us today. <laughs> I hope yes. that we will be able to have you in Venice maybe in the future.
I would love that. Yeah, hopefully in a post-pandemic world when everything's better um, and Amabie has won and everyone draw your own picture of Amabie, hopefully to help us get into a better place. That would be fantastic. Um, oh, I did see that, that Musicies encyclopedias are in fact translated in Italian. So lucky you because they are not in English and that is amazing. <laughs> so um, amazing. you have more resources than I have. So thanks everyone so much for attending. It's been great. I really appreciate it. Thank you very it, much. And, uh, thank you all so much. So. Goodbye. Thank you again and thank you to all the people who attended yeah. this online conference. Yeah.